We, during the course of this project, we, we, we obviously investigated and talked about intellectual humility quite a bit. But we also found in investigating intellectual humility, and this came up in all sorts of talks, various other ideas and ideas of importance came to the forefront. One of those ideas, for example, is in the very uh, uh, title of the project, and that is conviction. Professor Anka Finger, who is a professor of German studies, media studies, and comparative literary and cultural studies here at UConn, and also uh, has been uh, directing from the Humanities Institute <coughs> our Digital Humanities and Media Studies Initiative, and many other things, has been part of the project in all sorts of ways. Uh, Professor Finger quickly from the outset of the project said, look, there's a lot of work going on on this. We need some work going on on what conviction is. What is it and uh, uh, how does it work? So um, she's going to be talking about conviction as a cultural concept. And then uh, also uh, uh, right after uh, uh, Professor Finger talks, we're going to have uh, talk two which is coming to us from Greenhouse Studios, which is our, our next door neighbors in this building downstairs and a partner uh, from the beginning in uh, this project. Tom Scheinfeld, who uh, is the director of Greenhouse Studios, uh, uh, is right there at the end. And Tom and Brendan and I actually were involved early on in re helping support each other's projects, uh, both projects in digital scholarship that, that we'll hear about, but also um, <coughs> Uh, you know, him supporting, as we'll find out, by interacting with our researchers, uh, our project as well. And so one way of thinking about this is that concepts of both conviction that were, yes, in the, in the, in the title, but were perhaps being understudied in the project, rising to the forefront and taking us to the next step. And also a process and way of engaging with scholarship that has emerged out of the project thanks to our partnership with Greenhouse that is also hopefully taking us and our ideas of the project in a new direction and then taking a further next step. So uh, for talk two, we'll have Wes Hamrick, uh, who's a Mellon Fellow from Greenhouse Studio, uh, Studios, uh, uh, funded by the Mellon Foundation, Alessandra Tanazzini, who we've all met before, Brooke Foti, uh, I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name, come out. Uh, who is a design technologist from Greenhouse Studios, and Tom Lee, who is also a design technologist from Greenhouse Studios, and they'll be talking about Husky Review, building an augmented <coughs> reality app, and with that, I'll stop talking and sit down. Okay, I'm done. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, thank you all for still being here. I know it's Friday afternoon, and I'm sure you'd rather have a glass of wine in your hand or some beer. So um, I'll make it brief. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Michael in particular for supporting the Conviction Project. Um, that has been a hiccup, which I'll quickly talk about. Um, but we're still here, and we're actually growing. Um, thank you to Brendan, um, and thank you to Templeton, and of course to Yukon for making this very exciting and uh, ongoing. This is actually um, what I'm giving you, a little bit the origin story of the Conviction Project. Um, and there's more work to come. Um, on Wednesday, those of you who actually attended the event um, at the hall in Hartford, I don't know if you recall the moment when Carrie Co Kelly Corrigan was talking about her own convictions, um, sort of leading into having um, W. Camille Bell talk about that. And um, if you recall, she actually mentioned her inner negotiations, if you will, of saying, you know, I debate with myself, I go out and gather intel, and then I play that a little bit around the room, and then try it out, and work it, and then, you know, slowly I will come to my conviction, and then I sit in it. Which to me was a perfect introduction to how we want to think about conviction, or how I have come to think about conviction, which is kind of like a nest. She really describes a story of building a kind of structure or architecture whereby she tries it out, there's a cognitive process, there actually is a process, and she builds a home that she likes for herself, a nest within which she can sit. And it's very comfortable because her saying in a very sort of fat voice, I sit in it. And you know, it very much indicated that. <coughs> it's going to be very difficult to get me out of this very comfortable nest. 
So when I talk about concepts of culture, I should tell my own story in terms of being trained as a comparative literature and culture scholar. And my passion and affliction, if you will, is comparison. I have a very hard time looking at one thing and looking at one home. So I come at conviction from two sub-disciplines that I play with and I engage with. One is intercultural communication, and the other one is media studies, outside of literature and cultural studies. So when I teach a very large lecture course on intercultural competence, I tend to use this model of um, intercultural competence whereby students get to play with the idea that what they see is not what you get. Meaning that the iceberg model of intercultural communication is cognizant of the fact that the expressions of cultures or the product of cultures is what you get above the waterline, the tip of the iceberg. So when we look at fine arts, when we look at literature, when we look at drama, it doesn't have to be high culture. When you look at I don't know, video games, when you look at TV, when you look at anything that is an actual product of a culture, this is the end result, if you will, of value systems that lie underneath. And once you look underneath this particular iceberg um, waterline, you get a whole lot of wobblinesses, meaning notions about logic and validity, patterns of visual perception, um, patterns of handling emotion, cosmologies, tempo of work, notions of leadership. So all of these kinds of <coughs> patterns and beliefs of how you should conduct yourself, of what in cultural hermeneutics we call shared structures of meaning, those are out of you. When we go into a different group, and I tend to define cultures as not you know, defined by national borders, but really by networks or groups that are defined as such, that think of this, uh, themselves as cultures, and behave like cultures, all of what's underneath this iceberg um, top is something you don't get if you're foreign to it. So when we think about values in intercultural communication, there also is um, a set of different um, definitions and, and models with which you can engage. I'm using Shalom Schwartz's um, value dimensions. What I want to point you to as you read is that values are guiding principles because they are shared values. They're shared entities of meaning. They're infused with feeling. Um, we've started to talk about emotions. Some of you have talked about this <coughs> affect, but I want to cannot possibly overemphasize the element of emotion. They motivate action. Obviously, we need values in order to do something. Um, there are also standards for judging. And most importantly, just as the iceberg um, bottom is, under, is, is outside of awareness, it is rarely conscious. So we're aware of a relative importance of values that shapes the behavior. But at the same time, we often perform these kinds of values out of um, some sort of machine type um, habit. We know it. We know the codes without having to define them. And we simply do what's right. When it comes to personal conviction, what I'm mostly interested in coming at it from these particular fields of, of inquiry um, is really personal conviction and personal conviction as it is related in story. So personal conviction as something that is narrated something that is reflective, something that is, <coughs> as Ken Corgan described, at least semi-cognizant, whereby you ask yourself the following questions. Where do our convictions come from? Why do they compel us to certain actions? <coughs> Are they generated or maintained by certain affects? What does it cost us to follow our convictions? And how do we communicate them to those around us? That's actually one of the most important to me as somebody who works with hermeneutics and the expression that is there, AKA the product that comes out of the cultural values um, that are being practiced. So um, in that regard, um, when we talk about cultural hermeneutics of conviction, um, there's really a combination of approaches 
that come together in how we want to talk about it in this particular conviction project with colleagues that um, we debated with in February, um, first week in February, affect studies. Um, those of you familiar with um, the literary trends, um, there has been a bit, tons of turns. There also has been an effective turn in the mid-90s, whereby um, based on cognitive science, but also on um, emotion studies, um, and I'm referring here to an essay by Rand Williams, um, affect studies has actually become very important um, in literary studies and the analysis of grief, fear, anxiety, happiness, and so forth in cultural productions. Um, in intercultural com uh, communication, the fluidity of culture and identity, there has been a lingering um, belief, if you will, that cultures are static and that identity is static. Uh, we very much try to work against that, um, which of course raises the level of ambiguities, but that's just how it is. Um, and media studies, whereby the mediation of conviction in this particular case, I think is of, of the utmost importance, as we just heard in the last panel, how do you actually express your convictions with the means that are at your disposal, especially at an age when the story writing really extends into the internet into social media and so forth, whereby it doesn't matter whether there's a fact, it can all be fiction, even around the facts, because you're in charge of the storytelling. We can talk about that a little bit more. So when I ask you to sort of entertain the notion of conviction as a home, we're starting to get into metaphoric territory where we can integrate home, moving home, becoming migrants, dismantling homes, rebuilding homes, and in terms of holding on to sitting in convictions versus actually dismantling them, entertaining other forms of architectures, maybe building in a few windows. Um, it's a whole different idea of, well, what are convictions really? Because most of the time, there are an interlinkage of cognitive debate and emotional um, attachments. Whether that's the home that has been presented to you by your family, by your region, by your country, by your favorite sports club. Um, these homes are in some way given to you, but you're also co-building them. And then you can decide, you know what? That sucks, I'm just going to build my own <coughs> and start entertaining different convictions. So um, I have um, built these three um, approaches around what kind of fields I would like to engage in this debate. So when I invited people to come to, uh, to um, the workshop, um, people contributed from media studies, from psychology, from intercultural communication, from history, thereby also breaking through the disciplinary homes and saying, well, wait a minute, you know, how are we actually dealing with conviction? in this particular field, how are we approaching it, how are we defining things, how can we interlate them, how can, actually, how, how can we build a discourse in that regard. Around media, there's a big difference whether we look at conviction through social media, in books, in radio, video film, or in images. How is conviction mediated? How are we trying to understand it within an algorithmic universe or, in fact, the deep fakes um, that Regina Rini just talked about on Bob's podcast, where, in fact, there ain't no truth anywhere, because there's no origin anymore. You know, we can, in fact, go back to Baudrillard and say, you know what, it's all a copy now. And, uh, you know, that's a real issue. And, of course, um, talking about narratives, what kind of genres do we want to look at? And in fact, we want to just pin it down to a print or narrative kind of um, expression. I particularly am interested in manifestos. Manifestos as a genre of the utmost conviction you can put in any kind of printed form. Um, and there are those that are older than the Communist Manifesto, but I think we can all agree that the Communist Manifesto is one of great conviction and with tremendous historical result. <coughs> so, um, I've built this uh, conviction project around a number of 
media elements. Um, there's an introductory video. Um, the beginning was um, in my attempt to really get personal narratives um, into the open, I interviewed um, the former um, director of the NEH, um, William Bro Adams, um, who talked about conviction very much out of his childhood, but also out of his experience of the Vietnam War. Um, I talked to Anna Gromberg, who was a longtime dean at Auburn University and is a gender-performing um, gay activist who founded the first Women's Leadership Institute at Auburn, um, a fascinating discussion, and Michael Byram, who's part of this project about his work for the European Commission on Intercultural Citizenship. <coughs> and the Conviction Workshop um, introduced Christiane Heibach, Media Studies, Pianalto, you can read the titles of their conversations and presentations, introduced them to each other where we had a very fruitful debate simply engaging in sort of breaking through our own homes of how we want to think about conviction. The podcast will be available on Tuesday, so I encourage you all to listen to that. And the next step, if you will, is uh, Subjective Matters. This is going to be the um, book that Manuela and I are editing. She is my partner in crime when it comes to intercultural competence. Um, and uh, we will invite a number of people in addition to who has been uh, at the workshop. And I hope very much that the next step after that will be that I can also introduce the storytelling of your own convictions into the intercultural competence lecture that I teach on a regular basis. Because the hardest thing that I encountered is to actually engage with your own convictions and actually find a narrative for it. Students had a very hard time with that in the classroom uh, because it is a U-turn, you know, an intercultural term for reflecting on yourself. And a U-turn is very, very difficult if you don't have anything to reflect it off of. I will leave it there. I'm very open to questions. Thank you very much. Um, so, so first of all, thanks to Michael and to Brendan um, for including us. Um, I've been hearing about this project um, almost from its inception by way of Brendan. Um, so it's really exciting to, to, be, um, to hear about the research you guys have been doing and to be a part of it um, ourselves. Uh, so Husky Review is one of the projects from Greenhouse Studios. Greenhouse Studios is the Digital Humanities Center here at UConn. Um, so for the presentation, I'll say a bit about Greenhouse Studios and the work, kind of work that we do, and then Alessandra will talk about the philosophical and intellectual rationale for the project, and then finally, uh, Brooke and Tom will talk about the app itself. Um, so, so Greenhouse Studios is an incubator for collaborative research in the humanities, most of which ends up being um, digital. Um, we. Um, what we typically do for most of our projects is we put together a diverse project team, um, diverse in terms of skills, interests, and background. Um, we typically have one or two faculty researchers on our project team. Um, we also have a librarian or an archivist, um, an artist, and also one or two design technologists. Um, design technologists being people who can code, build websites, um, do virtual reality, things like that. Um, so this is the Husky Review project team. Um, on the left there is Alessandra, who's a philosopher, as you all know, who's done work in intellectual <coughs> humility. Uh, next to Alessandra is Claire Costley Kingu, who teaches in the English department here at UConn. She studies religion and literature in the early modern period. Um, next to her is, is Brooke, who's a design technologist. Um, man in the middle there is myself. Um, I serve as the project manager on for the Husky Review team. Uh, standing next to me is Graham Stinnett. He's an archivist here at UConn, and he, he has a particular interest in, in activism and alternative press collections. And next to, to Graham is um, Tom Scheinfeld, who's the director of Greenhouse Studios. 
Um, so once we put together our diverse project team, we present the team with a prompt, and then collectively the team um, wrestles with this prompt. We put them through a series of design thinking um, exercises or sprints, and um, collectively the team decides what direction they want to take the project based on uh, the prompt. Um, so the prompt can be a physical object, it can be a box of archival documents, uh, it could be an abstract concept. Uh, the, the prompt for the Husky Review project is actually the, the overall question that um, the Humility and Conviction project is tasked with. That is, how do you balance um, principal conviction with humility. Um, so this is our uh, design process model, and this takes place over the course of about two years. Um, so the, the first green bubble there, if you can see, is, is understand, the understand phase. And that's when we, as we assemble the team, the diverse team, we present them with the prompt, in this case the humility and conviction and public life prompt. We talk about the prompt, we do our design thinking exercises, and we just try to come to grips intellectually with, with the prompt. Uh, the, the second bubble there is the understand phase of the project, of the, of the design process. Um, and, uh, I'm sorry, the identify stage, excuse me. So the identify stage is where uh, the team ultimately decides what direction they want to take the project, what kind of format the project is going to take. Um, and so for, for the Husky Review team, we were really interested in intervening in the physical landscape and representing uh, certain forgotten history related to student activism and protests on the Yukon campus. Um, however, we were somewhat limited in our skills. Um, we, we, we knew about um, augmented reality. We knew we wanted to do that, but we really didn't have the skills to do it ourselves. Um, so, so that's when we brought Tom Lee on board um, to help us out. He had some experience and expertise in that area, and we were able to start making the project, um, the app that we're now currently building. So the, the center um, green bubble there is the build phase of the design process. That's where we are now. Uh, we should be wrapping up sometime this summer. And the next two phases are the review and disseminate phase of the design process. So the review phase, we test things out, we reflect on what we've done, make revisions if we feel those are necessary. And then finally, the disseminate uh, phase of the design process. That's where we publish and publicize the app, and we'll also publish any other research, like journal articles, that may have come out of our work on the project. Um, so, so that's a bit about Greenhouse Studios and what we do. Um, I'll now turn things over to Alessandra. Can you scroll to see that she can? Yep, that's great. Right? It's going back where both way. Oh, there we are. <laughs> so, this was the thought. Um, I hope I'm making, I'm still making sense because I'm quite jet lagged. <laughs> so, this was the thought. Uh, the thought was that it's not wholly up to us in many ways whether we develop arrogant or humble tendencies. But the environment in which we grow in makes a big difference. And one of the things that might encourage somebody to develop arrogant tendencies is living in a society that has a shared identity of, say, exceptionalism, right? You know, of, uh, or in the British case, you know, of sort of a sense of superiority of some sort, right? <laughs> if, if, you are, if you grew up in a, in a society where the sense of national identity, at least for the people who sort of came closely associated with, with what is normal in that nation, I mean, in Britain is interesting, I think, because there is no place for black people in British social identity in a way that they are not problematic. Paul Gilroy has written this in his famous book, There Ain't No Black in the Union Jack, right? Uh, pointing out that black people are always crime-related, right? 
They're either the victim of crimes or the perpetrator of crime. But if you think of what it is to be British, there is no positive role there for black people. No, that's not perhaps in the case in the States, but anyway, the state has a <coughs> shared social identity of exceptionalism, right? The land of, what is it, the brain? Freedom and opportunity. Right? So, so the thought there is, is that shared national identity might make a difference as to whether you're more prone to develop a feeling of superiority, and if I'm right, then arrogance is somewhat connected to this. And of course, one of the ways in which we build uh, this shared national identity is through men monuments, through memory, and one of the ways in which we produce memories, shared memories, through monuments. I just love the title, Monumental <laughs> Arrogance. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's not, right, so there's been all this debate about, you know, very confederate statues in the States, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, other examples in the UK. And the argument has always been you have to keep those statues there because otherwise you are eroding, eroding the past, right? They are there because that's history, we need to know our history. That is just a category error. Monuments are not there to remind people of history, or not purely. If they were, they would be in, in museums, right? That's what museums are for. They remind people of various things. They are artifacts, right? There. Monument, we don't have statues to Hitler, right? No one says we really ought to have a statue to Hitler, otherwise we forget Nazism. <laughs> <laughs> right? We don't have statues, and Michael makes that point also in his forthcoming book, right? So <laughs> clearly monuments play a different role. And the role is they put forward something as noteworthy, admirable worthy of emulation, and usually agentic. Usually is agents rather than victims. Uh, and that I think is very interesting in war monuments, where even in war monuments, there's always heroic soldiers rather than destroyed soldiers, right? We never celebrate the pain of war. There are exceptions, your Vietnam War memorial, right? Um, and so what you are doing with monuments is building a sense of what it is to be a notable, admirable, good example of your nation. Because usually, what you have monuments to is your own past. Right? And so, they are a way of building a sense of what's not, not worth it, your nation. Right? And, and monuments are built by the victors. And they tend to build a certain shared memories. They are often fictional, almost always somewhat selective and mythical. And the fact that those things are selected means that other things are neglected. Bounding more strongly, and there is somewhat speculative evidence on this, the fact that some things are selected means that other semantically related bits of information are repressed. So the thought here is that if you remember that event, but only remember it selectively, other aspects of that event become even more inaccessible. As opposed to events you don't even talk about. And so the idea is that through this selection process, our way of building monuments builds shared memories, shared memories that are the memories of the victors, and, and neglect the story of the oppressed, but don't just neglect it, actually prevent people from being able to remember it. Hence, the thought that one of the way of promoting a different sense of social identity is by changing the monumental structure around us. Since we haven't got the dog to actually do it physically, one way you can do it is by augmenting the reality. So bringing out those aspects that have been neglected by allowing through an app people to visit the site and see those things that are not normally remembered. With the view to promote 
a different understanding of the price and hopefully a different understanding of what it is to share a certain identity. And the identity we looked at is Yukon and I live in yeah, so um, the Husky Review app uh, basically takes um, material from the archives about um, from the human rights collection, specifically dealing with activism and protest incidents on campus. And what we're doing is we're basically uh, embedding those in the environment of UConn and allowing people to sort of explore these virtual exhibits. Um, basically, the way that it works is that you can pull, if you didn't get to try it, um, you pull up the map and see different events, uh, and you can place the exhibits um, in the space while you're walking around the campus. Um, so I think we have one example of, a, of that here. Yes, so it just happened that the everything after this is in Silver Cross, which happens to be one of our sites. So we thought we'd give you a little window into that site now. Um, I feel like we're skipping class. There we go. Thank you. Uh, that's the building that we'll be going to in a minute. Yes. So um, back in the 70s, that was the main library on campus. Now it's just an administration building where students go to pay their fee bill and get out as fast as they can. Um, so about in 1974, about 200 students, a couple of days after marching to Gully Hall, which is um, where the president is, um, they president's office, they had given a list of their demands. And a few days later, they staged a sit-in in um, the Wilbur Cross Library. Um, around midnight, when the library closed, um, then they started making, well, they were very quiet, but people were unhappy with it. By the time 6 a.m. rolled around, students were being forcibly dragged out. Now you would know nothing about this now. Um, but this is pretty well documented. So when you pull up the experience in the space, or wherever you are, um, these are basically the items that you'll see. To the left um, is this little floating microphone that will give you an audio recording of um, an interview with the head of the library at the time, Norman Stevens. Um, to the left of, or to the right of that is um, a photograph, one of very, very many um, that are from that day. Uh, to the right of that is the campus newspaper at the time, which recounts um, the event, but also gives a partial list of some of the demands. To the right of that is um, a page about it in the Nutmeg Yearbook, which is, I think, very interesting to look at. And to the right of that is a flyer, which was basically telling everyone that this is going to happen and inviting them to it. Um, the last item in that space is a um, kind of summarized list of demands, which really kind of talked about what they were trying to have accomplished. So many of you may have already downloaded the preview to the beta. Um, and I know there's a little bit of an issue with Android, so we'll get that figured out. But if you haven't signed up yet to get an invitation, this is um, the link. You're going to fill out a form, and then we'll send you an invitation. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have time for about uh, 10 minutes for questions. Um, and before we all go over to Wilbur Cross and start walking around with our phones and uh, <laughs> finding about uh, renewing our convictions. Um, Heather. Yeah, thank you all so much. Uh, so my question is for the Greenhouse Studios Husky Review team. Um, so I think this is a fascinating idea and I'm so glad you're pursuing it. Um, one thought I had, if you, just, if you were thinking about expanding this is in the future, doing anything having to do with the depot campus so the depot campus. briefly we have yeah because yeah. there's a lot of history there and right and it's not necessarily good history. <laughs> right yeah. yeah and so I think so the deep the uh, Yukon has a depot campus the depot campus um, used to be an asylum so, and I actually don't know a lot about it. As a faculty member here, I would really like to know more about it and like to know what happened there. Um, and I think that might be a really useful way um, to, illus to illustrate and encourage intellectual humility for, for members of the campus. So one of the, I, if I could just chime in. So one of the things uh, we've talked to the archives about is after we, you know, we're, we're like like Wes said, sort of an incubator. Um, and one of the things we've been talking to the the, the new head of 
um, Archives and Special Collections at UConn uh, about is possibly turning this over to the archives. Mm -hmm. um, there, um, uh, Rebecca Palmer, who's the new, the new head of Archives and Special Collections, is particularly interested in working uh, with faculty to incorporate archival material into their, mm -hmm. across the disciplines, into their teaching. Um, and one thing we've talked about is taking this as a vehicle for doing that, where class projects could do some research on the Depot campus, put it into the app, and then make it available later on for, for, for classes down the road. Um, so Tom and Brooke and, and the rest of the team have built this in a way that it is extensible. So there could be, so right now this is, we have, a, we have these stories of protest, mm -hmm. but we could have another layer. You could have another layer, which is you know, the Depot campus layer, or you know, stories of asylum, or, or whatever, whatever it might be. Great. Louise. Um, so the app kind of seems like Pokemon Go for information around campus. But the problem is, not everybody wants to play Pokemon Go. And I suspect in this case, the kinds of people who aren't going to want to play are precisely the people who need to be learning that information. Um, and so I'm wondering if you've thought about um, strategies to try to encourage people who would be the least likely to use the app about how to get them involved in actually wanting to use it. Yeah, that's, that, that is one thing we've thought about. And like one of the like the extensions or like separate packages we've thought of doing is um, like a sports package. Hmm. So like yeah. you're kind of a long history of you know, sports teams. And um, you know, we, we thought maybe even the the technology mm -hmm. could be useful or you know, um, like the sports team. So uh, UConn might be interested in that. So if you have people interested in like, you know, the sports teams and then like all these other packages are like available for, you know, download or yeah. whatever, um, you know, people might select, oh, campus protest, I might select that. So that's yeah. one kind of mundane way that we've thought that's about really addressing cool that again. Brendan. You know what actually uh, I'll, I'll ask later. <laughs> I know we're short. You're class. <laughs> um, yeah, Anka, um, at the end of your presentation, you talked about the difficulty of um, getting students to talk about their own personal narratives. And personal narrative is something that we really utilize in our dialogue. Um, and so sometimes that works well, and sometimes it doesn't. But I know I've certainly encountered that challenge. You know, one time I asked students, we were having um, a dialogue about abortion, and I really we emphasize, you know, tell a personal story of how you came to something that brought you to experience and understand your values behind abortion. And so I was facilitating <clears throat> from up front. I had three groups. Two groups were going okay. I just came to the third one. Students were going around saying, "I'm pro life. I'm pro choice. I'm pro." And I was just like, yeah. <laughs> um, "So if you have any, what what?" Tips can you offer insights to help students understand what a narrative is mm -hmm. and why their own might be important in a classroom? That's a great question. Um, I've, I've gotten to it um, by using different media, and it's also part of the reason why I wanted to um, record these personal narratives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm and talking about what is conviction, what is conviction for you, do you have recommendations about conviction, blah, 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 with people who are in the public eye. Um, and I would have produced about five to seven of them. Unfortunately, I you know, played tennis with conviction and tore my Achilles tendon, so that was you know, the end of that. <laughs> um, but in a way, in that particular large course, um, I play um, Adichie's uh, The Dangers mm -hmm. of a Single okay. Story. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of their intro mm -hmm. to um, talking about your own story to begin with, making it very personal, uh, making it fun, but also making it controversial. Um, I have um, groups of four or five, the class is 100, groups of four or five actually get into digital storytelling with very specific mm -hmm. guidance as to what is digital storytelling and then who do you need, you know, who tells the story, who writes the story, who edits the story, who provides the visuals. and What's interesting to me is that it's actually easier for them to mediate their own story rather than just sit there and tell it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they can pick pictures from family, they can pick pictures from, you know, whatever experience they want to relate. Mm -hmm. I had one incredible story from 
um, the child of Bosnian refugees mm -hmm. who talked about mass murder. Mm -hmm. And she packed that into a digital story, showed it in front of the entire class, mm -hmm. and it was extremely difficult for them to talk about that. Mm -hmm. But she thanked me afterwards. She's like, I've never told this story. Huh. Wow. Um, and so by showing them how people tell their own mm -hmm. stories, and by then try having them try that out through a mediation process without having to expose themselves in a class mm -hmm. of 100. Of 100. Um, and then maybe starting out with these narratives, with these conversations mm -hmm. with people in the public eye, you know, they're much older than they are, of course, but it's like, okay, now we're going to talk about conviction. Because mm -hmm. conviction is something that's, you know, at least at that age group, very, very, very private because it's so very, very, very ambiguous. Mm -hmm. You know, what do I think? Why do I think that? And why do I believe what I believe? I mean, actually, around Thanksgiving, it's a fall class, um, and I <coughs> talk a lot about culture as home and home as culture. Mm -hmm. um, so tell me what it is you're doing in, at Thanksgiving, and you know, how, that, how does that make you your particular culture of family or mm -hmm. your particular family culture? Um, and we had sometimes very frank conversations about, well, wait a minute, why do we actually do that? Mm -hmm. um, so this kind of self-reflective process of um, beginning to question the habituations that they've fallen into, the sort of the cultural imprint that they're living with without actually knowing it's a cultural imprint. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the very, you know, multi-pronged approach that I now want to extend by also talking about conviction. No. What do we leave and why do we do that? Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'm afraid we are out of time, and but we are not done with the conference because we still have a reception, and we have a reception in a place that will be able to learn about its history, at least the things that happened there, thanks to the work of uh, our people up here, and learn about perhaps how to question our convictions as well <laughs> uh, about the history of UConn. Uh, join me in thanking.